What's up my homies? So I got some really, really good feedback on my last video going over some review articles on post syndrome. And if you haven't watched that video yet, please make sure you do so because this video is a follow-up to that one and I'll go ahead and link that video below. So in this video, I'm going to cover two studies people brought up in response to my last video claiming I deliberately glossed over them to push a pro agenda or something like that. And in the process, they called me a complete moron. Now, I did didn't deliberately exclude these studies, but you should understand that due to the funding of the post finasteride syndrome foundation, there are literally hundreds of tiny case reports and low quality studies that have been published on the uh, the post finasteride syndrome website, and it would be impossible to go over each one. And it's really not necessary because review articles covering all these studies have already been dismissed uh, because of the poor methodology as well as overwhelming bias. Nevertheless, people have brought up two particular studies, and I think they're detailed enough that they're worth more than just a comment to respond to them. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to go over these studies, and as always, I will link them below so you can review them yourself should you choose to do so. So let's get the ball rolling and take a look at this first study. This one is from Milan, Italy, and it is entitled Altered Methylation Pattern of the SRD5A2 Gene in the Cerebrospinal Fluid of post finasteride Patients, a pilot study. It was published in 2019, and it is cited on a lot of anti finasteride forums by the pseudo-intellectual neckbeards desperate for confirmation bias because it is the first study that tried to come up with a biochemical mechanism for the prolonged side effects of finasteride or the alleged prolonged side effects of, of finasteride. Now, the science here is pretty technical, which gives it the impression of being legitimate, hence why so many people seem to cite it without any kind of skepticism. So before I deduce why this study's conclusions are bullshit, I'm going to have to back up a bit and get into some of the theories so people can have a better understanding of what is being talked about here. So. The big problem the PFS folks have in their crusade against finasteride is trying to explain how such a drug could cause side effects long term after it is gone from the body. Nobody disputes the fact that finasteride can cause side effects. The issue of contention is if the side effects are irreversible. I mean, after all, the plasma half-life of finasteride is just six to eight hours and tissue binding is four to five days, which is also why people can use it infrequently and still get good results. But after stopping finasteride, the DHT levels return to normal within 14 days. I explained this in my last video where we looked at a study that showed there was no difference in sex hormone levels between post finasteride syndrome patients and people who never took finasteride. So since we can't look at the endocrine system to establish any kind of cause and effect, what kind of lingering effect could finasteride possibly have long after it's washed out of the body? Well, to be fair, I think it's worth mentioning that there are in fact some drugs that can cause permanent side effects. Uh, most of these drugs are used to treat severe schizophrenia like uh, phenothiazine drugs. And you may have seen some commercials on TV for something called tardive dyskine dyskinesia. Now this is a movement disorder that people on these drugs get and it can be permanent. Now unlike PFS, tardive dyskinesia was recognized as a real side effect of uh, drugs like Thorazine in the 1950s right after after these drugs were introduced to the market. I mean, it didn't take decades before the first cases were reported, like what we see with uh, PFS, where finasteride has been around since 1992, yet we didn't even start hearing about it um, until roughly 10 to 15 years ago at most. And unlike finasteride, users of phenothiazine didn't have a tardivedyskinesiahelp.com forum back then to help uh, bring the tardive dyskinesia sufferers together to share stories. So tardive dyskinesia, TD, is real and not due to a no placebo effect for sure. Now, there are some theories, or actually a lot of theories, about how psychiatric drugs may cause prolonged or even permanent side effects, and one of those theories is called epigenetic modification. So this epigenetic modification is what this Italian paper on PFS is all about. So what is epigenetic modification? Well, first, you need to remember that all proteins in the body are synthesized in the cells, and that includes proteins like the 5A reductase enzymes that are inhibited by finasteride, and that enzyme is what converts testosterone into dihydrotestosterone, which is what kills, hair, uh, kills your hair. So the master blueprints for these proteins are contained in our genes, which is our DNA, and all that is determined at conception. So there is a gene for each type of the 5A reductase of which 
which there are three types. But when we are talking about hair loss, we normally only talk about type two, since type one and type three are not active, active on the scalp, and finasteride predominantly inhibits the type two 5A reductase. Now, cells have the interesting ability to switch your genes on and off, and one way that happens is by a process called methylation. So in chemistry, a methyl group is a carbon atom with three hydrogen atoms, and methyl groups can stick to other molecules like DNA. When that happens, this process is called methylation, and this causes DNA to stop making proteins. So for example, the 5A reductase gene could stop making 5A reductase. So with all that in mind, let's take another look at the title and see if it makes more sense. The title again is Altered Methylation Pattern of the SRD5A2 Gene in the Cerebrospinal Fluid of Postfinasteride Patients, a pilot study. So the SRD5A2 gene in the title is the name of the specific gene for the type 2 5 alpha reductase enzyme that finasteride inhibits. So what they are saying is that this gene might be switched off in the spinal fluid, therefore in the brain, of post-finasteride patients. I mean, that sounds pretty scary, doesn't it? But before we flush our finasteride down the toilet and just shave it, bro, let's actually look at the study and try to understand it. So. In this article, blood and spinal fluid were examined in 16 PFS patients recruited from the Italian network of finasteride side effects, which I guess is the Italian equivalent of propitiahelp.com. These PFS patients were compared with a group of healthy patients. The PFS patients had all been on 1 to 1.25 milligrams of daily finasteride and had been off it for at least three months. One disappointing aspect of the study is that they are pretty vague about the symptoms the PFS patients had. I mean, they just mentioned that they reported persistent sexual and mental health side effects, but it would have been much more interesting if they reported on some of the persistent side effects the anti-finasteride clowns talk about you know, like shrinking penis, uh, shrinking height, numbed anus, and spontaneously developing a desire to take female hormones and transition into a woman. I mean, I'm not joking. This is what they actually believe finasteride did to them. But anyways, in the study, they looked at the genes that express the type 1 and type 2 forms of the 5-alpha reductase in the blood and spinal fluid from both groups using pretty sophisticated methods, which they describe in detail, but aren't too important to the outcome of the study. Now, what they found was that the five, uh, the type 1 5AR gene appeared to be normal in both blood and spinal fluid in both groups. So in PFS patients and normal people, there were no differences at all. But in the case of the type 2 5AR gene, which is what finasteride and dutasteride both inhibit, it was found that the gene was normal in the blood of both PFS patients and normal patients, but in the case of 2,5-AR gene in the spinal fluid, it was found to be methylated in 9 out of the 16 PFS patients and only 1 out of the 13 healthy patients. So, the numbers are small, but statistically significant. Next up, they then looked at neurosteroid levels like allopregnanolone and sex hormone levels like testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, and others in the spinal fluid and compared the levels between the PFS patients with and without methylated genes and with controls. And although some differences were found, it is difficult to detect any real pattern. Like, for example... The highest DHT levels were seen in the methylated PFS patients, but that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because methylation should inhibit the production of the 5AR reductase enzyme, and so DHT levels should be low. I mean, this is why it is important to have large sample sizes when examining study results, because if you are looking at a lot of parameters in a very small number of subjects, you are bound to find some differences just based on chance alone. I mean, it's funny how the anti-finasteride crowd doesn't mention that, and how they gloss over the limitations of the studies that they promote. So I think a lot of these findings are just noise in the data due to the low number of subjects, but on the other hand, the neurosteroid spinal fluid levels were not significantly related to the amount of methylation seen. So to quote the study, Quote, in PFS patients, neuroactive steroid cerebral spinal fluid levels were not significantly related to the percentage of SRD5A2 gene promoter methylation. 
unquote. And another really big blow to this methylation theory was that there was no correlation of any of the sexual symptoms and depressive symptoms between PFS patients with methylated DNA and those without methylated DNA. So it's kind of hard to blame PFS symptoms on methylation when there is no correlation between methylation and symptoms. But the fact remains that more 5-AR methylation was seen in the spinal fluid of PFS patients than with healthy patients. So is this the smoking gun for PFS that will finally make all the alleged finasteride victims into millionaires by suing Merck? Well, even the authors won't go that far, and keep in mind the authors are potentially biased. So to quote them, quote, the reason for the persistence of PFS symptoms even long after withdrawal in PFS patients remains a mystery, unquote. They wonder if somehow the drug lasts in the spinal fluid for months or even years, and that the methylated 5-AR gene doesn't allow the creation of new 5-AR enzymes, and this ends up uh, affecting neurosteroid levels. But this is just speculation. There is no test to confirm this, and they cannot give any evidence whatsoever that this drug could persist that long in the spinal fluid. Also, they don't know whether this methylation is actually something that is set during the embryonic development or due to finasteride itself. I mean, if it is a pre-existing condition, it might have nothing at all to do with finasteride. So I think what would have made this study much better is that they had compared PFS patients to patients with actual sexual dysfunction or depression who had never taken finasteride. It's certainly very possible these epigenetic abnormalities are widespread in people with these conditions and have have nothing to do with finasteride. Even the authors themselves admit this is this is possible in their conclusions. So this was a pilot study, and it might be a straw that PFS promoters can grasp onto to keep their fictitious syndrome alive in the hopes of striking it rich through litigation, but it certainly doesn't prove that there is any kind of biochemical basis to PFS. Much more likely, it is just psychogenic, as I already explained in great detail in my last video on post-finasteride syndrome. So, Let's move on and take a look at this second study. This second study is from Baylor, and it gets a lot of hype from finasteride fear-mongerers because they think it will be what finally causes the medical community to take them seriously and to stop laughing at them. The study is entitled Penile Vascular Abnormalities in Young Men with Persistent Side Effects After Finasteride Use for the Treatment of Androgenic Alopecia. Very, very long title. Anyways, it was published in February of 2020. So in this study, we have a group of 25 patients with symptoms of sexual dysfunction after finasteride use for androgenic alopecia, and they were compared to 28 healthy patients. So the first very frustrating aspect of the study that's worth mentioning is that the finasteride patients patients were on finasteride for an average of 18 months, but there is no information that I can find on how long they were off finasteride at the time of the study, or even if they were off it at all. And considering the claims made by those who have PFS, that symptoms persist or can even get worse when you stop taking the drugs, I think it should have been imperative for them to mention this. But anyways, both groups were given standard questionnaires about sexual function, mental health, and the finasteride group was given a penile ultrasound to assess penile blood flow, and unfortunately, the control group did not have penile ultrasound. So really, with regards to the ultrasound findings, there was no control group at all. So, so far, the methodology is quite poor. I mean, why in the hell would they exclude the control group here? I mean, I guess it's kind of hard to find volunteers to undergo penile ultrasound unless the nurse is really hot or something. So obviously I don't consider this a high quality study due to the lack of a true control group, but let me briefly give the results anyways. So as expected, when comparing a group of people complaining of sexual side effects with a healthy group of people, the answers given by the two groups to the questionnaires on sexual function were different. No big surprise there. The symptomatic group also scored worse on tests for depression. Again, no surprise. Most people who lose their hair will tell you that it's a very depressing experience. I mean, I'd tell you that for sure. Sexual dysfunction and depression definitely go hand in hand. Interestingly enough, but not too surprisingly, the finasteride group also had a lot of vague complaints such as fatigue, muscle atrophy, back pain, visual disturbances, weight gain, cold flashes, rapid aging, and loss of penis length, blah, 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 just to name a few. 
Is it just me, or do the finasteride haters seem to pick their side effects at random? I mean, if I were to go to propitiahelp.com and claim that taking finasteride caused crocodiles to take a sexual interest in me, they'd probably believe it. So, regarding the penile ultrasounds, which again weren't given to the control group, only the finasteride group had some abnormalities. There was about 17 out of 25 who experienced some abnormalities, and out of those 17, 8 out of 24 had arterial insufficiency, 5 out of 24 had borderline arterial insufficiency, and 4 out of 24 had venous leak. So these are physical findings that for sure could influence erectile function, but how are they related to finasteride? I mean, at least the last study had some hypotheses for possible causes of PFS, but how would finasteride cause arterial insufficiency, for instance? Keep in mind, people who stop finasteride have normal androgen levels, so even if suppressed their DHT could have caused some issues with arterial smooth muscle function, their DHT is now back to normal, so why would these problems persist? Sadly, there is no way for us to establish any causation with finasteride because, again, what this study needed was a control group of patients with sexual dysfunction who had never taken finasteride. I believe it is very likely that similar findings would be found in those patients, and finasteride has nothing at all to do with these findings. And since the same findings can occur with or without finasteride, you can't really say that finasteride is the cause of these persistent sides. I mean, for all we know, these people already had some problems before taking finasteride, and they just took them for granted until they heard about all the horrible things about finasteride and then pieced them together and without any evidence whatsoever came to the conclusion that finasteride caused all their problems. Bottom line, this study sucks, and to further reinforce that, here is a fun fact. Both these studies were founded by, were funded, I should say, by, you guessed it, the post Finasteride Syndrome Foundation, and both are featured prominently on their website as proof that there is something scientific going on that causes PFS. But as you can see, it's a bunch of smoke and mirrors, and this is, if this is the best they've got, they've really got their work cut out for them. But since many people are already convinced that this fictitious disease is real, it might be good enough to fool a jury or judge in rewarding punitive damages to plaintiffs who claim their lives were ruined by this drug. I mean, just notice how everybody who claims finasteride ruined their lives are all basement-dwelling dorks and losers who at best work minimum wage jobs if they're even employed at all. I mean, why wouldn't they want to use a fake condition to become millionaires? They're never going to make anything of themselves on their own, after all, and there's no guarantee that Donald Trump is going to write them another stimulus check that they can use to pay off their monthly Fortnite account bills. So this fake disease is really their way out of having to have a real life, so they're really pushing for it. But anyways, after carefully reviewing these studies, we're still left with some very important questions. So number one, are there, si are there real side effects from finasteride that persist or develop after stopping finasteride? We don't have any evidence of this, and if people want to claim that it does, then the burden of proof is on them. Two, what is the incidence of these alleged side effects versus the incidence in the general population? Both sexual dysfunction and depression are common problems in general. I mean, just look at Viagra sales. And antidepressants are one of the most highly prescribed drugs in the United States. In fact, one government report published in 2011 states that about one in every 10 Americans is taking an antidepressant drug. So with such common conditions, how do you establish they are due to finasteride and not just coincidental problems? I mean, to make things worse, hair loss itself is strongly associated with depression and other psychiatric condition. I mean, it's depressing to lose your hair. It's no more valid to claim finasteride caused erectile dysfunction or depression than it is to claim that an, uh, taking an aspirin did it, for instance. I mean, the big difference is that aspirin doesn't have the same negative press behind it, so it isn't likely to give you a nocebo effect. I mean, if you remember in my last video, it was established that people who have heard of finasteride's negative side effects were far more likely to get them, so the power of suggestion is very real and very powerful. Number three, even if the incidence of these symptoms is higher in post-finasteride syndrome than in the general population, how can you exclude the possibility of a nocebo effect as opposed to a real physical changes? I mean, let's face it. As I just said, fear-mongering works. Fear-mongering is very powerful. We see it every day when reading the forums. If you are afraid that something bad will happen if you take finasteride, then you will be looking for a problem even when there isn't one, and you'll end up convincing yourself something bad is happening and end up exaggerating minor side effects into something really, really major like PFS. So, number four. 
What could be the mechanism of prolonged side effects after the drug is out of the system? Does the drug hang around for years? There's no evidence of that. Does it methylate the 5AR genes and permanently alter neurosteroid synthesis? Well, that sounds very sciencey, and it seems to be enough to convince people on the PropeciaHelp.com forums, but as we saw in this video, it is far from a proven hypothesis. It hasn't been proven that the effects people say finasteride gave them were caused by finasteride, and that's the bottom line. If the Post-Finasteride Syndrome Foundation really wants wanted a study to corroborate their claims about PFS, what they should be investing in is a large randomized double-blinded control study where people get finasteride or placebo for a limited period of time such as a year and then are followed up for side effects. If they were so desperate to convince everybody that finasteride is evil, why don't they do this? I mean, is it too expensive? Why would that matter? Any cost would be recuperated several times over through subsequent litigation if they could prove that PFS existed. No. The real reason why they don't, they won't do it is because they're afraid their theory will fall apart and they'll inadvertently prove that their organization has no reason to exist. So it's not in their best interest to do a real study, otherwise the people from the Propecia Help Forum may actually have to get real jobs. So they'd rather fund these small pilot studies with no control groups and small sample sizes that really don't prove anything but are enough to convince scientifically illiterate people that they are legitimate and valid. So. The last question is, why is PFS still controversial decades after finasteride was introduced? There have been drugs taken off the market before after they were discovered to be dangerous like Vioxx, but this usually happens pretty quickly, sometimes in the span of just a few months. Finasteride, on the other hand, has been around since 1992, and it is still to this day one of the most prescribed drugs in the world, and it is uh, the most effective treatment for hair loss and one of the most effective treatments for enlarged prostate, of which it is also prescribed for. The PFS Foundation is basically just the medical equivalent of QAnon, and their supporters are every bit as much conspiracy theorists who are willing to believe anything without evidence, provided it tells them what they want to hear. So I'm very sorry to finasteride detractors, but I'm still calling post-finasteride syndrome for what it is, and that is FAKE NEWS! All right, if you guys are a U.S. citizen, make sure you go out and vote if you have early voting in your, in your state. Otherwise, just vote as soon as possible, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Take care.